Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good, good, good. Good morning, all of our uh, online attenders. Glad you could join us. Uh, if you're if you're on Facebook, go ahead and leave a comment with your name and whoever else is watching with you. We'd love to know who's joining us. So be sure to do that for us. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. Yeah, Merca. I uh, I don't I'm not wearing shoes right now. I don't know if the camera can see it, but I got my Captain America socks on. Yep, so I had, I had to take my shoes off because uh, Captain America. But uh, I used to have a Captain America shirt, but it uh, got really, like, tattered. It became my work shirt, you know, and I eventually had to get rid of it. So I got to get another one. That's what I should do. Every 4th of July, I should buy another Captain America shirt. That'd be, pretty, that'd be fun. Um, but, yeah, I hope you guys uh, are enjoying your time off. If you're, I, I, I watched a video from somebody that I, I watch on YouTube this morning. They had posted something. And uh, they said, you know, happy 4th, enjoy your vacation. But for those of you guys that have to work today, know that you're appreciated for having to work on the holiday. And I thought that was a really cool thing. So if you have to work today on July 4th, know that we appreciate you working. Or tomorrow, you have to work the holiday. I know I have uh, at my store in Hamden that's not open yet, uh, I have people working on it today. So I'm very appreciative of them coming out and working on the holiday. Um, So if you have to work on the holiday, thank you for working. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Hopefully you're being compensated extra for having to work the holiday. <laughs> but if not, you can have my appreciation at least. Uh, well, man, it's, a, it's good to celebrate uh, this country. It's, it's, it's such a, I definitely believe, even with uh, some of the, the unfortunate things that have happened in our country recently, that this is still one of, if not the best countries in the world. And uh, I'm definitely proud to be an American. Um, and uh, so I hope that that the biggest thing about that, though, for me, is that America is such a great place to celebrate the Lord's kingdom because we have the freedom to speak out about the Lord's kingdom, to sing out about the Lord's kingdom, to post things like this on Facebook in public for everyone to see. We don't have to have fear of inviting people to church or anything like that. That's a luxury that we take for advantage a lot, and so I'm so grateful for that. That's probably at, at least... This morning, I think that's that's one of the biggest things about the 4th of July that we should be celebrating as a church is that we can uh, worship in freedom and we can speak the truth, hopefully in love, um, but uh, we can speak the truth without fear of backlash um, from the government. So that's that's super, super awesome. And so, But I want to invite you guys to not just celebrate America today. I want to invite you guys in church to celebrate the kingdom of the Lord together, to sing loud and to be proud of the fact that we don't just belong to America. We are Americans. We're proud to be Americans. But uh, more importantly, we belong to the kingdom of heaven. We belong to the king. We belong to Jesus. So I want to invite you guys to stand and sing this together.
got a new song for you guys today. Um, I think this is like a big song on Caleb, so if you listen to I don't really listen to Caleb very much, but because um, I'm a Spotify guy, but uh, if you guys listen to Caleb uh, a lot, you probably have heard this one. So if you know it, make sure you sing it out because uh, the rest of us, including myself, are still getting familiar with it. Oh, 
God, you are so good to us, and you have loved us, um, and we thank you for that love. We thank you for the salvation that you offer through your son, your only son, that uh, came and gave his life so that we could have life eternal, so that we could have life everlasting, so that we would never perish, as uh, John 3.16 says, and um, also, though, God, that we would have life right now, here and now, uh, a different kind of life not the kind of life that the world offers or that uh, anything else offers, but an abundant life, a life that is full, a life that is hopeful, a life that is impactful through your son's sacrifice. And we just pray that uh, this morning we would not lose focus on the life that you've given. We would not succumb to the temptation to live the way that the world lives or to live the way that we want to live, but that instead we would surrender this morning and say, God, the life that you have for me is the life that I want to live. The life that you've given, that you paid for through your sacrifice is the life that I want to live. And uh, please uh, help us to have the strength to say that. And may the things that are done and said and saying this morning, may they point to that truth that we have new life in you and that we're called to live it um, and that we're called to love you. In your name I pray. Amen.
guys can have a seat. And so that's a, that's a good thing to be here. And so I'm glad to say hello to all of you folks online. Got a bunch of people from Meriden as well, Wallingford. And so just you know, think about wherever you're at, uh, whether you're here physically in the building. So welcome, guys. Glad you're here. Whether you're uh, somewhere else today because of your schedule or travel or because you're, you don't live in Connecticut, I guess that's okay not to be here in person, right? And so uh, we want to say welcome to you. Happy Independence Day. Happy Fourth of July. And uh, I think sometimes we, uh, we, we don't recognize enough what the freedoms of our nation entail to us spiritually. And so because we've never really understood what it, would, what it is like to live in a place where you cannot freely share your faith and where the message of Jesus is stifled. And we live in a country where we can boldly proclaim the message of Jesus wherever we're at. And so I just think that's cool. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever take advantage of that. I think that's exciting. And so, man, I'm, I'm thankful that we can be here. I know this is a crazy busy weekend. And so here's what I want to do. Uh, um, we, have, we have some picnics going on, some different things going on at people's house. And so I'm wondering, what is your favorite food to enjoy at your July 4th picnic, okay? Now, it doesn't have to happen on July 4th, but, you know, what is your favorite? So if you're online, go ahead and type it in right now. I got my phone up here. Hey, if you're here live, what, what's your favorite food to have on July 4th? Go ahead and yell it out. Hummel's hot dogs, all right? What'd you get? All right. What is it? Oh, <laughs> I am no respecter of food. I like that. There you go. There you go. I love tuna mac. Tuna, what? Tuna mac. Tuna mac? All right. Who says tuna mac is not a July 4th menu item, right? <laughs> no, so, I like it. This, hey, listen, you're Barbara. Right? <laughs> well, listen, I happen to know that Tom is cooking pulled pork today, right? So, yeah. So, so if anybody wants to follow him on the way home, he's only feeding 30 other people, but, you know, stand in line, right? And so, yeah, good. So, and so that is awesome. I, it's a great day to be able to be together, to enjoy one another's company. So I just want to say, first off, thank you for uh, connecting with us today. Uh, thank you for getting with us. And here's what we want to do today. I want us to intentionally pray about all the festivities that we're going to have. Maybe you already had them. Maybe they were yesterday. Maybe they're a little on later today. Maybe they're tomorrow. I want us to pray for boldness to be the people and the voice that God wants us to be at our picnics and at our parties with our friends, with our relatives, with our coworkers, whomever you're associating with. I want us to, to pray for boldness that we can be the voice of God, whatever that looks like. Maybe that's just simply to be kind and to be hospitable. Perhaps it goes further than that for us to share our faith. But that's what I want us to pray for. That's what I want to pray for you. And in a minute, we'll take a time to pray for that together. So, but I want you to, us to stay connected as best we can. If this is your very first time uh, to be here, whether it's online or whether it's in person, uh, we'd love for you to turn your uh, phone toward the screen and take a picture of this QR code. It will take you to our first time guest uh, connection card. And we'd love for you to fill that out. It's a way for us to get connected. It's also a way for you to ask any questions you may have about the church. It's also a way for you to let us know how we can pray for you. And this week, we're going to send you a gift, but we're also going to connect with you uh, through whatever form, whether it's by text or email, uh, just to uh, see how we can serve you, how best we can uh, be the hands and feet of Jesus for you this week. And so we want to, to remind you of that. And then if this is your normal hangout, then we want you to, to go to our uh, electronic program, which is found at www.pondhill.net forward slash Sunday. Take the opportunity to fill out a connection card there. If you're live in person, there are connection cards on the back table. Uh, you can pick one of those up and you can still fill it out uh, with a pen and uh, let us know. We want to know how we can pray for you, how we can serve you, how we can help you, how we can minister to you. And I just want to let you know, this is not just so that we can minister to you. If your neighbor has a need uh, that uh, you can't meet alone and you need the help, the church to help you meet that, let us know because we want to partner with you to help you reach your neighbors, all right? And so that's an important part. Jesus called us to a primary mission field of wherever you live, whatever street that is. Your neighbors are your primary mission field. And so uh, with that, I want you to take the opportunity to like and share 
uh, our video. If you're online or even if you're here in person, you can go ahead and take out your phone. Uh, you can share. My, my, my phone does this. It scrolls up and it tells me who's watching. And so today it does it with somebody different every week. I think last week was Andrew Masood. And I knew he was watching because he was right over there. All right. But, but today it's Shannon. So Shannon, I know you're watching back there on Facebook. And so uh, if you don't mind, share our video because there could be one of your friends that's sitting at home, you know, not doing anything, or perhaps they're, you know, boiling ribs on the side and uh, they could put their phone up and they could watch the service. I just think the, the, the message that we've sang about, the message that we're going to share is so important that it's good for our friends. And so I want to encourage you to like the, like the video and to share that. And here's how that works, right? Sharing goes out right away to your friends and family and they see that in their feed. Liking helps, uh, helps P Facebook see that people are liking what we're doing and so they show it automatically to more people. Okay, so I just want to remind you, that's why that's important. That's why we say it every week. You say, Pastor Mike, are we ever not going to say that? I hope we just keep saying it, to be honest with you. I hope we don't forget about it because it's important for us uh, to share the message of Jesus wherever we can because as we just sang about, there are so many people who are broken and who are struggling who need the message of Jesus. And this is one simple way that we can deliver that message. So go ahead, if you haven't already, go ahead and like that video, share uh, the video out there, and just uh, let us know how we can serve and love our community, how we can serve one another. We want to take a moment just to pray, though, all right? And so before we do, I want to be mindful of our one of our global partners this week. This is our global partner, the Harmon family. They are in Puerto Rico. And so this month, we are highlighting missionaries from uh, North America, South America, and the islands in between. And so we want to be mindful of pray for the Harmons. Right now, they are actually in service. I know that. I saw their feed before I went on our feed. I saw their live feed. So I know they're in service. We just want to pray for them, have a great service, a powerful impact in their community, that God keeps them safe, and that God lets the voice of God go out very clearly through their ministry there at Maranatha Baptist Church. And so I ask you to pray for them as you pray for your needs and as you pray for one another, right? So would you humble yourselves? Would you bow your heads and have a time of prayer uh, together with me? Father, we want to pause in the busyness of our routines and uh, engage in something that's, that is a little bit unknown for us. And that, I don't mean that we don't know how to pray, but what I mean is that when we engage in prayer, we step into this, this spiritual realm where, God, we ask you to work in our behalf. Whether that be for a health need or for a concern, for a decision that we're making, for a financial hardship that we're praying for a path out of, whether it be for a struggle in a relationship that we're having that we just don't quite know how to, how to, how to say the right thing or how to, how to talk about what, what's, what's going on, whether it be uh, with a work-related issue that we're bringing, we, we bring this to you because we need your wisdom, we need your patience, we need your kindness and how to deal with people, God, because quite honestly, sometimes we're at the very end of our road, and we need your wisdom. We, we need your help in being bold to speak with people about this great message that you have given us, about the love that you have loved us with and we are called to love others with. Sometimes we just need your help to love others. And so we need your boldness. And uh, today, God, there are going to be parties and there are going to be picnics and there are going to be get-togethers and there's going to be family and there's going to be opportunity for us to share our faith, even if it's just simply by serving a glass of water, God. And so I pray that you would help us to serve our faith well, to demonstrate our faith well by serving those who are around us. And if we get an opportunity to give an answer for the reason of our faith, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us the right words to say, that we would be bold. I pray for our missionaries, the Harmon family, right now as they are in service, as Jerry is getting ready to deliver a message of truth from your scriptures. I pray that you would empower him, embolden him to be able to share 
this message. As the people of Maranatha Baptist Church rally around their community, I pray, God, that you would empower them to speak the truth and to love their neighbors well. Just like we are called to love our neighbors, so they are called to love their neighbors as well. And so I pray that we would not be slack in what you have called us to do. I pray, God, that you would speak to us through your scripture. May it be challenging, convicting, encouraging, and life-bringing to our heart today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. On July 8, 1741, a visiting pastor delivered a message in Enfield, Connecticut. The Yale graduate had been pastoring a few miles north in Massachusetts and had delivered this same message at his church, to, and, and we don't really know what happened at that particular engagement, but we do know that he was invited to come and share this message again with the people in that area. And uh, it was received so intensely on this occasion that many people credit this sermon, this teaching, this idea as a catalyst for the first great awakening. Here's, here's how the sermon uh, uh, came together. The sermon emphasized God's wrath upon unbelievers after death to a very real, horrific, and fiery hell with an underlying point that God has given humans a chance to confess their sins. It, it, is, it is merely the will of God that keeps wicked people from being overtaken by the devil and his minions and cast into the furnace of hell. He likened, it, he likened the devil and his host to a greedy, hungry lions that see their prey and expect to have it, but are for the present kept back by the almighty hand of God. He stated that mankind's own attempt to avoid this place, this bottomless gulf, due to the overwhelming weight and pressures toward hell, are insignificant as a spider's web would be against a falling rock. This act of grace from God has given humans a chance to believe and to trust in Jesus. It is stated by firsthand accounts that the description of the wrath of God was so effective that sinners hung onto the pews in front of them in fear that the ground would open up immediately and hell would swallow them up. That is an intense feeling. People, for the first time in their lives, got this understanding of the overwhelming debt that sin caused in our life and an overwhelming feeling of the judgment of God if our sinfulness is left unabated. And that's really what fueled the Great Awakening. People began to get a sense of their own sinfulness before God, and the wrath of God, and the judgment of God, and people literally came to faith by the thousands. By the thousands. Of course, if you know this, I'm speaking of Jonathan Edwards and his sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he began to preach and to teach this idea of the, the filth of our sin before God. You say, well, Pastor Mike, that, that, that's kind of strange, you know, because, you know, most people in our church, we claim to be followers of Jesus. Why are we talking about the the filth of our sin before God and the destruction of hell and all of this, I think it's because oftentimes in our walk with God, we understand what sin is, but sin begins to lose its disgustingness in our life. Over the process of time, we become a little bit more accustomed to our sin. We become a little bit more accustomed to the ways of life that are not in line with Jesus and we forget that God is still a God who loves righteousness. And we hang on to his mercy and his grace, and we, and we thank him for that, while at the same time downplaying the significance of sin in our lives. Now, you and I, we know David. David's often called uh, the man after God's own heart. But I want to take you to a psalm, and I want to show you how David felt about the disgusting nature of his sin in an attempt for us to begin to hate our own sinfulness a little bit more. 
and to pursue righteousness a little bit greater and to deal with our sin the proper way as opposed to, well, like we, we like to do, we like to justify our sin. We like to scale our sin. Oftentimes, we like to sweep our sin under the rug. We like to hold on to it a little bit too long. And in reality, what God is saying is sin is still sin, and it is still a grievance to the heart of God, and my people need to know that sinfulness needs to be abandoned in our heart and our life. I want you to notice here uh, some facts about Psalm 38. This is a psalm that we're talking about. Psalm chapter 38, in the, in the title, it says that this psalm is a psalm of David. We don't really know why David is writing this psalm. It seems to come in a time when, it, when David is experiencing some type of sickness, some type of suffering, and he begins to describe the depths of his feeling in Psalm chapter 38. He acquaints this suffering of the Lord, this suffering that he's enduring, to the judgment of the Lord. Specifically, the judgment of the Lord placed upon him because of some type of sin. And we'll see that as we go down through this. This psalm is often classified as a, a, a penitential psalm, which means it's a song of penance. It's a song of our hearts crying out before the Lord, uh, expressing our sorrow and our grief for our sinfulness. It's also, uh, you, if you look at the Psalms, there's not very many of them. It's with Psalm 6, Psalms 32, Psalm 38 that we're looking at. Psalm 51, which we're familiar with, that's the Psalm that David prays after the sin with Bathsheba. Psalm 102, Psalm 130, and Psalm 143. It's a prayer of repentance because of sin. But the Psalm hopes to show us the depth of sorrow associated with our sinfulness so that we can compare the depths of our sorrow with the heights of God's mercy. Those are the two things that Jonathan Edwards preached about. He preached about the fact that our sin was so great, there's nothing that can help us escape that except from the mercy of a loving, kind God. That was what he got. And I think sometimes we need that again. We need to see the depths of our sinfulness so that we can abstain from sin, so that we can deal with it the proper way. For David's prayer, we not only catch a glimpse of his dealing with his sin and its consequences in his life, but we also learn a powerful lesson about how we are to deal with sin in our lives. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through this psalm and I'm going to show you how David responded. And then I want to pull out just two thoughts that we need to learn in our life in dealing with our own sin, okay? So here, let's, let's look at David's response to his sin, all right? The first thing we need to understand is in David's response to his sin, David sees the seriousness of his sin. He doesn't just push it under, uh, uh, the, uh, under the rug. He doesn't just say, my sin is less compared to other people. He sees the seriousness of of his sin. In fact, in Psalm chapter 38, verse 1 and 2, look what he says. He says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure, for thine arrows uh, stick, me, uh, stick fast in me, and thy hand presses me sore. That's how the psalm starts out. What I find interesting in this verse is David is not asking God to take away his chastening. He understands that he deserves his chastening. He understands that his sin is a reproach to God, and therefore, because it's an offense to God, God as a righteous judge deserves to be able to take action upon his sinfulness. What he asks is that he does not punish him in his wrath. Did you see that? It's a small distinction in the verse, but it's a massive distinction. He understands that a righteous God has to act upon unrighteousness. But he says, God, if you chasten me, do not chasten me in your wrath. Uh, do not rebuke me in your wrath. Do not chasten me in your hot displeasure. He understands the seriousness of his sin. He sees his sin as a serious offense toward God. And can I tell you that this is an important step? Because sometimes we like to minimize our sin before God. We minimize our transgressions before God. And we don't see them as a big deal. And we move on. 
the Apostle Paul deals with this in, in Romans chapter number 8. He talks about the sinfulness of mankind in, in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, he says, For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, right? There's none righteous, no, not one. He says, we've all sinned and we all still commit sin. And his idea was not that we would, that we would, uh, that we would, underestimate our sin, but his idea is that we would recognize that we do sin and that sin is still serious to God's eyes. And so then he goes on in chapter 5 and chapter 6, he talks about the gift of God of eternal life. He talks about how God came and sent his son and you can have, and in chapter 6, he, he ends it uh, by saying to us, he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, right? But he says something in chapter 6 that's so important. He says, should we continue in sin simply because we can ask God to forgive us and it's forgiven. And in the harshest language he could use, he says this, God forbid that we would continue in sin. For how can we who have been made dead unto sin be comfortable living in sin any longer? I'm going to say to you, we've become a little bit too comfortable with our sin. And we don't think that it's as serious as it really is. And God calls us to repentance. He calls us to repentance. Not only does David see the seriousness of his sin, but David also accepts the discipline of God. In, in this psalm, David expresses his physical sickness. Look at this, Psalm chapter 38, verse 3 through 5. He says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sins. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head as an heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Do you see the heaviness of David's sinfulness. Do you see, not only is David, is he experiencing some type of <clears throat> physical difficulty, but he recognizes that his physical difficulty is a judgment for his sin. Somehow, God made this clear to him, and he is yet in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his difficulty, he's glorifying God who is dealing with his sin because he knows once God deals with it, then he will learn a lesson and he will come through as righteous. That, that's what he's attaining to. In each Psalm, David's specific prayer is that God will rebuke him. God will not rebuke him in anger or discipline him in wrath, does this mean that David does not want to be rebuked or that he is rejecting discipline? Not at all. Actually, in this psalm, he is saying that I deserve this and I welcome it as a way to purify me, as a way to deal with the unrighteousness that is in me. The emphasis is not upon the discipline, but upon those words, anger and wrath. David almost welcomes this so that he can be rid of his sinfulness. But it's more than just a physical sickness. Notice this. There is a mental and a spiritual sorrow as well. Psalm chapter 38, verse number six. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all day long. This is not physical. This is mental anguish. In fact, look what he says in Psalm 38, verse number eight. He says, I am feeble and sore broken. That's physical. But he concludes with this one. I have roared by reason of the, what does it say? The inner turmoil that's going on, the disquietness that's in my heart. It's in my heart. And I sometimes ask myself, when is the last time that I was this upset about my sinfulness? That I was this upset about something that I had wronged? You say, well, 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 well what if you didn't wrong God? Can I just say to you that every offense is an offense against God? David sinned with Bathsheba, and in Psalm 51, he says, Against you, God, and you only have I sinned. Had he sinned against Bathsheba? Yeah. Bathsheba, Uriah, the kingdom, his, his, his leadership and, and, and integrity before the people. I mean, certainly he'd sinned against a lot of people. But he recognized that his offenses are against primarily God. And so David comes and he, he notices this, 
disquietness. It also affects us in, uh, socially as well. In verse number 11, he says, my loved ones and my friends, they stand afar off. In verse number 11, he says, my family, they keep their distance. In verse number 12, he says, my enemies look at me and they look for ways in which they can take advantage of my difficulty, my struggle, so that they can defeat me. Isn't this a reality of our sinfulness? Have you ever made a mistake at work? And then the next thing you know, your coworker is saying, well, who are you to say about God? Do you remember when you did, right? And our enemies rise up against us, right? This is that uneasy feeling that should accompany our sinfulness. We've grown, grown way too comfortable with our sin. And we've not allowed our transgressions to impact us the way they ought to. That is, that leads to confession and repentance. You see, that's what David is doing. He's bringing himself, he's acknowledging the struggle that's going on. But ultimately, what, where we need to get is David needs to respond to his sin properly. David needs to respond to it properly. And this is how David does it. I love this. You ready? I think you're going to love this too. Ready? Here's what it is. David leans into the mercy of God. Now, I, can I just say to you, aren't you glad for the mercy of God? I don't know about you, but I mean, I blow it on a daily basis. It's probably more like hourly, if I'm being honest, sometimes multiple times an hour. And I think sometimes in our struggle to live righteously, we look at ourselves and we say, well, I'm not righteous and I blow it. And because there's so many offenses, we don't become really overwhelmed by it, right? And I think there's a solution to that. I'll get to that in a little bit later, but there's a solution to that. You know, I'm just going to get to it now. My thought is, is if I sin and God brings conviction to my heart, then I should act properly toward it right then. I shouldn't let them build up. Does that make sense to you? Because if I let them build up, I will never remember them all, right? I just never will remember them all. And I want to take my offenses as serious, like David takes them, as an offense to God and his righteousness, as a struggle in my relationship with other people, and as a hindrance to my testimony to speak of Jesus freely, right? So I need to know how to handle it right. David knows what he deserves is justice, we talked about this a little bit last week. We talked about the fact that God knows our sinfulness. Nothing escapes God. You did not get away with that little sin. Nothing escapes God. He knows. And what we deserve is to be chastened by the Lord. What we deserve is to be, is to be a, a, a disciplined that's what we deserve. So David leans into God's mercy. David does not shy away from the fact that he's deserving of God's judgment or God's chastening. But he also knows that, that it, just as God as an, a righteous God, just as God is a chastening God, he is also a loving God. He is also a God full of mercy. And so David leans into that mercy. Here's how he does it. Psalm chapter 38, verse number Lord, verse number uh, nine. He says, Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. God, you see how this is impacting me. You see that I understand that my sin is serious, that this is, this is not something to laugh over. This is not something to laugh about. You know that this is serious, God. And so he takes the next step. He says, God, you know what's going on inside me. This that's inside me is not hid from you, God. See, God knows the inside just as well as he knows the outside. David should know this because when he was anointed king, uh, after you know that first king didn't work so well, uh, Samuel's told to go and anoint a king after his own heart, but don't look on the outside because man looks on the outside and God looks, where does he look? He sees our heart. He sees your heart. And when we say that we're serious about our sin and that we want to deal with it properly, God not only hears our words on the outside, but he sees what's going on, on the inside. He knows. He knows. Lean into God's mercy. Then David confessed his trust in God. Let's look at this. Psalm chapter 38, verse number 15. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope, right? Thou wilt hear me, 
O Lord my God. Did you hear that? David said, in thee do I hope. He's leaning into the mercy of God. He's not trusting on his ability to be righteous again. He's trusting in the God of mercy, right? And so he knows that when he handles his sin appropriately, correctly, that he can lean into God. He can put his hope in God. He can trust in God. And then David acknowledges his sin and confesses it before God. I love what it says here. Psalm chapter 38, verse 17 through 18. He says, for I am ready to halt and my sorrow is continually before me. He says, I'm done. I'm, I, I, you know, I am finished with this. And he's talking about his, his physical being. He, according to this, he thinks he's going to die. But look what he says. But I will declare mine iniquity and I will be sorry for my sin. Don't miss that. He's ready to go, but he is going to declare his iniquity and he is going to be sorry. Even if it means that he passes away, that this sickness becomes greater than him and, and, and he leaves this earthly realm, he is not going to blame God. He is going to confess his sin before God. He's going to acknowledge his sin and confess it before the Lord. Is, uh, one, one, one preacher said this. He said, the purpose of this discipline is to bring honest confession followed by a corresponding change in life. Can I say to you, that he did. He said, Lord, do you see on the inside? I'm wrong. My sin is wrong before you. I'm saying to you that I'm not backing out of your chastening. I'm not asking you to take it away. But what I am going to do is I'm going to lean in your mercy and I'm going to confess I was wrong. I was wrong. And I'm going to trust in your mercy. This is the proper response to sin before God. David gives us insight into how we should respond to our sin. Just as David found hope in the midst of his sinfulness, so we too can find hope when we respond to our sin properly. We can find hope when we respond to our sin correctly. So let's talk about our response to sin. I think that's so important, all right? There are many biblical words that we could look at to talk about this idea of responding to our sin. But I think if we just keep it simple, it'll make the most sense to us, all right? So I want to give you two words that that deal with how we respond to our sin. And you may say, well, those words are the exact same words, and I want to contend that they are abs absolutely not the same words, all right? And here's what my hope is. If we are to find hope when we respond to sin correct correctly, we must understand these two actions. Are you ready? Here they are. Number one, we must understand confession. We must learn to confess. And when I think about confession, I think about two ideas. The first one is we have got to agree with God about our sin. We've got to agree with God about our sin. In our world, the first step we must take is to agree with God. And here's what I mean. What God calls sin is sin. Are you with me? Because we live in a world that wants to relabel sin. That's what we do. We live in a world that wants to call sin something different than sin. And it's all in an attempt to, to miss out on the idea that God is a righteous God. And therefore, because he is righteous, he is ultimately the one who dictates what is right and what is wrong. And we love to point at everybody else's sin and say to them, they're trying to relabel their sin. But we don't like to point at me and say, I'm trying to relabel sin. So today, what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to go out thinking, oh, those people over there, those people over there, they're relabeling their sin. I want us to just relabel our sin, all right? What do you have in your life that you allow to stick around because you've labeled it a bad habit and not sin? What have you allowed in your, ha in your house, in your life, in, in, in your sphere of influence that is a wrong against God that you're trying to rename as something else so that you can continue to behave in that pattern, in that lifestyle. Sin is sin, and if we're going to confess sin, we've got to agree with God about our sin. We've got to say, this is, right, this is wrong, and this is right. It's not new for people to call sin by another name. It's not new for people to question the validity of sin. It's not new for people to reject God and say, there, there is no God, I'll just do what I want to. In fact, I've been reading in the Kings this week. I've been reading in Judge, read in Judges before that. 
And it's very common for people to do what is right in their own eyes. And in essence, what they're doing is they're not agreeing with God about their sin. And the first step we must take is to agree with God about our sin. Check this out. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8. Here's what it says. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We got a truth problem. I'm not just talking about in our world. Sometimes we got a truth problem because we do not label sin, sin. We put up with it. Well, 1 John 1.10, if, it if it wasn't enough in 1.8, he says this, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word isn't in us. Well, God, that's not sin. You know what we just did? We just said, God, you're a liar. That's what we say. God, you're not being honest because we want to call sin something different than sin, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. That's what John says. So the first thing we have to do is we have to agree with God about our sin. And then secondly, we have to acknowledge our sin toward him. We have to acknowledge our sin toward him. Once we agree with God about our sin, then we have to say, God, I, I do it this way. I says, God, it's me again. You were right and I was wrong. You were right and I was wrong. Can I say to you, I can't even tell you how many times I say that throughout my day. It's more than I want to confess to you. But if we agree with God, that confession says it's not just, okay, I agree with you, but that we acknowledge that we were wrong, that we were wrong. Psalm chapter 38, verse 18, look what it says. It says, for I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. I love that. I love this too. First John chapter one, verse number 19, right? Verse number nine, right in between verse eight and verse 10 that says, hey, if we say we have no sin, then, then we don't know the truth. We're calling God a liar. Here's what he says. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, lean into his mercy. Are you with me? Sometimes, this, this, is, this is like a free point for you. Sometimes we have to go to God and we have to go to God and we have to say, God, I agree that this was wrong. And I have to acknowledge, I, I agree it's wrong. I agree with you this is wrong. And I agree that I was wrong and you were right. And sometimes I need to take that a step further and I need to go to somebody else who I've offended. And I need to say to them, you know what? I was wrong when I said that. I was wrong when I did that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Sometimes we need to take that next step because it's, it's not just God that we offend sometimes. It's not just God that we sin against sometimes. Sometimes it's a spouse. Sometimes it's a coworker. Sometimes it's a neighbor. Sometimes it's a relative. Sometimes it's a child. Sometimes it's a parent. But our response to sin has got to be the same thing. It starts with confession. Right? Now let me go to the next thing. Here, here's the way I liken this. They're, they're, they're kind of like two two sides of the same coin. I hate that. I hate that analogy. You know, two sides of the same. We hear that all the time, right? It's one thing to go to God. I'm, this is going to be God over here. It's one thing to go to God. You know, God, you're right. and I was wrong. And just keep walking this way. See, dealing with sin is not just that we acknowledge our sin. It's actually we take the next step, which is called repentance. Let me define what repentance is, right? God, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm gonna go do this. I'm going to change this. Repentance is when I actually begin to change. There was this guy who dressed really funny and people didn't like because he was all about living righteously before God. And his message was the message of repentance. Remember that guy? is some Baptist guy somewhere. Oh, John the Baptist, right? Yeah. And uh, he said, repent, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And sometimes we are big on confess, confess, confess. But can I say to you, confession implies doing something about it to change. And John called people to change. And I think righteousness is the ultimate call for us to change, right? So God says, here's what it says. So the first step of handling sin correctly is for me to agree with God that that was sin and that was wrong. To confess to him that I know that was right and I was wrong. And now to turn away from that sin, turn away from that behavior. This is what repentance is all about. And I believe that's what happened in David's life. Did that mean that David didn't sin any longer? No. <laughs> it meant that he sinned pretty soon thereafter he repented. 
Just like you and I sometimes repent and turn away and, and still struggle with it, right? But the idea is not to give up on our pursuit of righteousness. God wants us to confess our sin, right? To agree with him about our sin, to acknowledge our sin toward him. But then he also wants us to repent. Once we agree with God that we are wrong, we must choose to turn away from our sins. It is no longer okay in God's, from God's perspective for us simply to acknowledge our sinful sinfulness and not to turn away from it. Because not turning away from it does not mean that we're leaning into the mercy of God. It means that we are trampling over the mercy of God. And be not deceived. God is not mocked. He knows what's on the inside as well as what we say on the outside. We've got to see the seriousness of our sin, and we've got to begin to respond in a biblical way. We find hope when we respond to our sin correctly. Now watch this, last verse of Psalm 38, Psalm 38, verse number 22. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation, right? David leans into the mercy of God. He confesses his sin. He acknowledges it. He turns away, and then he says, okay, God, I'm depending on you to help me. I'm depending on you to help me because you are my salvation. He knew that he could lean into the mercy of God. He knew that if he dealt with his sinfulness correctly, that he would have hope. But listen to me. When we recognize our sinfulness, there's also this idea that sometimes we want to kind of bury it. And I want to tell you what Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. It says, For he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and... So that's get that confess and... What does it say? What's that word? Is it, oh, repentance. Yes, forsaketh, right? Turns away from that sin. Shall have... What's the word there we like? Mercy. Mercy. Yeah, so God says, I want you to deal with your sin in the proper way. What does that mean? Confess your sin before God. Don't sweep it under the rug. Confess your sin before God. That means agree with God, acknowledge your sin before God, and then turn away from your sin. Pastor Mike, you don't know my sin. Absolutely, and you don't know my sin, right? You don't know how long I've been struggling with. Yes, and you don't know how long I've been struggling with anything, but here's the truth. The truth is God came to set us free from every addiction and every bondage. And what we've got to do is we've got to see our struggle as sin and stop re rewriting what it is. And we've got to come to God and we've got to say, God, I agree with you. This is wrong. And I acknowledge that I have wronged you. And I'm turning away from that. That's what God requires. He that covereth his sin, can I say it? He that relabels his sin, he that ignores his sin, right? I mean, these are the same words that it's, it's referring to there. He that lets his sin stay with him, right, shall not prosper. Pastor Mike, what does that mean? Well, Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The reason we're not experiencing the life that God has for us is because we allow sin to stick around too long. Too long. That's for those of us who, who know Jesus, who, who, who understand God and his grace and his mercy and his desire for righteousness. But can I say to you, there may be some who are listening, uh, who are here today, that may say, what does that mean for me? I'm not even a Christ follower yet. Well, there's, there's great news for you because the way that we deal with sin is the same way you should deal with your sin. Agree with God. Acknowledge your sin before God. Call out to him for forgiveness and repent and turn away from it. Here's what Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. The way I deal with sin in my life is the same way someone who's not a follower of Jesus should deal with sin in their life. They should confess it. <laughs> they should agree with God. They should acknowledge their sin before God. And then they should cry out to God for forgiveness and strive to live righteous before him. I hope that you and I will get a fresh vision of the seriousness of our sin and that we will respond correctly. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that you would just help us to take this psalm of hope 
about dealing with our sin properly, dealing with it correctly, and that we would begin to deal with our sin correctly. Man, we like to keep sin around way too long. And we wonder, and we're, we wonder, where is the victory? Where is the life that you've experienced for us? And yet, right beside us is that sinful behavior. So God, I pray that you would help us to deal with our sin properly. And that in doing so, we would experience the life that you have for us. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Let me give you a couple of next steps today. I think it'd be great to go back and read Psalm chapter 38. And if you haven't, I'd love for you to read Psalm chapter number one. It's just nine verses, uh, 10 verses. And so I think it'd be great for you to read. And then a, a verse to memorize or meditate on is that Psalm chapter 38, verse number 18. I think that'd be great to write down a three by five card. Keep it by your desk this week. Uh, keep it uh, you know, somewhere where you'll see it. And then if you've never asked God to forgive you, I want to let you know that our sins have created this incredible chasm between us and God but he was unwilling to let it stay there. And so he invites us to deal with our sin properly by seeking forgiveness. How do we do that? We confess our sin before God. We call out to him for forgiveness and we strive to live differently through repentance. And then if you are a follower of Jesus today, I cannot stress enough, deal with your sin correctly and find hope. Deal with your sin correctly and find hope.